Now, the Lexington, who was on our port beam, and in her task grew on our port beam, probably just short of the horizon, suffered bomb and torpedo hits, and she seemed to be under control. But about mid-afternoon, an explosion rocked her. This touched off fires below decks that were uncontrollable. She displayed a, sing displayed a signal, fire is not under control. This was followed by another signal, this ship needs help. The commanding officer, Captain Frederick C. Sherman, gave the order to abandon ship. I watched the Lexington Inferno from the signal bridge of the Yorktown. The Lexington was in a hopeless condition. After assurances that all hands had cleared the hapless ship, the order was given to sink her. The destroyer Phelps was ordered to sink the carrier with torpedoes. Uh, the, they were all there. They finally realized that <clears throat> the main thing was to protect, protect the carrier. You know, it had only been it's just a, a very short time, a, a few years' time, that they realized that the aircraft carrier was going to be the the main force and not the battleships. And we, we were still a battleship navy up at that point uh, until our battleships were all sunk there. That uh, They finally realized that the carrier was the main thing, so they had to protect the carrier at all costs. So they would make up this task force of a, of a, a carrier and uh, 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 outbound with a carrier on, on either side and... Uh, Ahead and behind would be uh, battle cruisers and uh, smaller type cruisers, and out beyond that would be a, a line of destroyers and so on. And of course, any time you'd make uh, uh, directional changes, that all had to be carefully coordinated so that they would swing around and still maintain their protection all, all around that. So it, it was quite a uh, Quite a dance to choreograph, I would say. But that was the main thing to always keep these protective layers out around you. Know. The anti-aircraft screen for TF-17 was composed of a limited number of ships. Fire support was not adequate. Four destroyers concentrated in the eastern semicircle of the screen, with three widely separated destroyers in the western semicircle. The five cruisers were evenly distributed around the carriers on an inner circle. The absence of the firepower of the ships of TG-17.3 was keenly felt. When we, uh, when Lexington started the war, we still had uh, uh, twin eight-inch gun mounts, uh, two aft of the conning tower and two in front, two, two ahead of it, and uh, because it was still thought that that was part of the armament that we would need, that we might get into a surface battle and uh, need those, and so uh, we had those until some work, somewhat later. And we did, we did eventually get rid of them before we were sunk. The night before the attack of the Coral Sea Battle was a stormy night, and all our planes were in. And we noticed this aircraft coming in to signal that he wanted to land in the, uh, on our ship. And the, the lights looked funny, but they weren't right. Pretty soon, every ship started shooting at it. There was a Jap pilot trying to land on an aircraft carrier in the dark. He was he was trying to land. He he mistaken us for his own carrier. We were that close in the dark, and they didn't get him. He left, and whether he made his own ship, we we never found. It. The next morning. Our radar showed us where the invasion ships were, and they were with three aircraft carriers. And I flew out taking pictures. We sank the Soho, 
one carrier. I got pictures of that. And uh, then there was two carriers damaged. And it's a good thing because if they hadn't a da we hadn't a damaged those two ships, they, they were in dry dock during the Midway battle, so that cut them out of using two more carriers, which would have been a balance of power. During the Japanese attack, each carrier maneuvered independently of the other. The Yorktown turned initially to the right to avoid torpedoes and continued in a southwesterly direction away from the Lexington, the flagship of the OTC, which remained in the original attack area. DF-17 broke up into two groups. Three cruisers and three destroyers accompanied the Yorktown, while two cruisers and four destroyers remained with the Lexington. No attempt appears to have been made to readjust the screening ship to protect the after semicircle. Through this hole came the majority of the Japanese bombers. Later, the Morris was ordered to close this gap. When the attack ceased, the two carriers were six miles apart. Although Allied forces claimed a total of about 73 Japanese planes as a result of this action, actually only 43 Japanese planes were lost in combat. There's a lot of uh, different... Our planes were attacking them, and their planes were attacking us. Aerial fight. We did wonderful with our... They took them thirds off thirds, and we had to... By the copy of the 1.1, which is a pump pump. Only one problem, um, big problem. Hit the clips if you shook them, and why the sort of double will tank. They had to be perfectly balanced to go into the hearing. Oh. We threw a lot of one half, sometimes half, sometimes eight well, shots, and shoot, man, it was. It, but when you had it shooting, it was you know, that go. We were shooting from starboard. I was on the starboard side. The whole attack was from the whole side of the port side got hit by two bombs, three torpedoes. Okay, the lift, a seven degree lift port. And the captain was trying to zigzag in amongst the torpedoes, but he found the ship turned way too slow for the speed of the planes and took four torpedoes on the port bow. When the first torpedo hit the water on a port side, the Lexington's rudder was put to full right. Then, before the ship answered her rudder, the Japanese launched two torpedoes on her starboard bow. Her rudder was now put full left. More planes were seen dropping torpedoes on her port beam and quarter. The rudder was again shifted to full right. By this maneuvering, she succeeded in avoiding some torpedoes, but she took two hits in her port side. Immediately after the torpedo attack, she was hit by dive bombers, which scored two hits and five near misses. Because of the after torpedo hit, the Lexington took the seven to eight degree lift to port, flooding boiler room two, four, and six. This lift was counteracted, and the ship continued at 25 knots to land and launch planes. The serious damage which resulted from the torpedo hit on the forward gasoline tank was not immediately apparent. When a ship that size can shake as frightfully as it did from one torpedo, it's frightening. The ship was 898 feet long, 108 feet wide. It weighed 33,000 tons, and it was loaded with the whole bit that we could get aboard. When the torpedo hit, it actually shook the ship completely because as I was going from one compartment to the other on my way to the battle station, the second torpedo hit, and instead of my going through that door, I went right into the bulkhead because it had shaken me one direction and the ship the other. That's when I found out how hard a bulkhead can be. The third torpedo hit just about midships as I was on my way to the flight deck of my battle station. I was just head and shoulders above the flight deck when the ships when the third torpedo hit directly across the ship. 
103 feet across from me. I can see that yet. At 52 years, that, that torpedo can make so much of a fuss with flash, uh, water, and explosion sight. Just like riding on a car, but putting my own on a cross speed bump. It's true you hit it there, all you had to do was hang on, put your hands out and hit the bulkhead. And it hits bounce you. The whole ship jumped up in the air and came back down. Murdering number three. That was enough to turn ships over before. Still cruising at three knots. Those holes where the torpedoes and the water rushing in, he's had an awful time showing up the shore on the inside, but they finally got it and got it all shored up so that the normal bulkheads were breaking. Right. Uh, some of the bombs, it, uh, he had the 5 inch 25 broadside gun that had a whole marine division had one of them. One of those bombs hit the ready locker, which is slide, big shell that exploded just like a big flash. I knew guys were all right. I'm, after it was over, I walked over there and did it tough. The Yorktown recovered all her planes by 1300, the Lexington by 1414. As we approached our, our group, uh, there was a tremendous outburst from our plane, from our ships. I think it was some of the worst I've seen in the war uh, until they called it off. But they said, uh, they had given up, given us up, and uh, I recorded 5.1 hours in flight, half of that over half with a torpedo underneath, and uh, we, we landed aboard with no measurable fuel in the tanks, but everybody made it back on the board. And uh, anyway, I came back to my carrier out of gas, and my carrier was on fire and sinking. In no way was I going to go in the water, so I landed her on the, on the burning deck, and then I had to go swimming. <laughs> At 11 o'clock, they issued one apple and one sandwich to each person. Where they were doing quarter stations, mess cooks went went forward and got the food and distributed to all the everybody everybody throughout the ship. And I got sandwich and an apple, of course. You know, uh, but I noticed the motor room was no longer because I could hear how fast the engine motors were turning. But they were no longer running at a high speed. It was running probably around thirty two minutes, and it slowed down and stayed that way. And then, then I could hear the bouncing of the aircraft on the deck above them. I knew we were taking our aircraft back on board again. So whatever they did when they attacked the Japanese, they came back and landed on their ship. And on our ship then, we knew what was going on was they'd refueled them, re-torpedoed them, re-bombed them, reloaded their machine guns, and set them up ready to go again. That's what they were doing. And we were just going along a pretty good clip through the water. I was outside, yeah. I was on that one point one. Thank God. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. I got it. I'm glad I got the transfer. I lost the rating, but I uh, at least I got top five. That commander, Lieutenant Commander, he was the head of the part of the working party down there. He had communications with the skipper. Captain Sherman and told Captain Sherman, he says, Captain, if you got to take any more torpedoes or bombs, take them in the starboard side. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last we heard from him. And, uh, that whole curb murder yeah, got locked up. Back. After the planes left, Captain Sherman headed the ships further south 
and we were cruising between 20 and 24 knots with all those holes in one side and a ship for, uh, firefighting to watch. We were doing great until the, in the neighborhood of 430, they began starting the generators down below deck so that they could get fresh air and clean out the, the fumes of the air, the aviation gasoline. And all went well with the first three generators. And the fourth generator threw out sparks and set the fumes of fire. And that's when everything broke loose. One of those guys got into the ice cream while he dunk stand I had down there. Got this ice cream. Big old, uh, big five gallon. Bring them topside, and the guys are taking their helmets and dipping them in there. <laughs> At 1415, the Lexington had another internal explosion. At 1425, she reported fires out of control. At 1456, she requested assistance. At 1707, she was directed to abandon ship. At 1952, she was sunk by five torpedoes from the south. Thirty-five planes on deck sank with her. Anyway, I landed aboard and uh, was spotted on the front elevator. And as I proceeded to, to jump off the plane, there was a tremendous explosion underneath the plane and me and everybody else in it went up about three, four feet. There were explosions all around, and uh, the fuel the fuel lines had been ruptured on the uh, on the uh, legs and the low decks, and uh, they could not get the fuel. So we and the planes and everything else were destined to remain aboard. got out of the plane, I tried to get below decks, but uh, everything was sealed off. I had a good clarinet down there, and uh, a bottle of scotch that uh, was full, and uh, they had to go down with the ship. In the meantime, uh, about half the crew was on the bow and the other half on the stern. I was uh, toward the uh, stern, and uh, for about uh, two hours or so, we uh, stood back there wondering why we were still aboard, uh, waiting for the abandoned ship, because there were explosions after explosions all, all, uh, all through the afternoon. I remember uh, trying to get below deck to my cabin and having uh, to cross a, uh, a gun emplacement, and somebody had neatly piled up about half a dozen bodies. That was my introduction to the real war. Well, long about four in the afternoon, suddenly there was a terrific explosion. Now, I didn't feel anything, I just heard on the sound of our telephone that there was an explosion. The deck below and forward of the bridge, there was an explosion. And then the battery lock, there was a, a catapult room. Uh, the Lexington had, didn't have steam catapults, she had electric catapults. Later on, the ships all had steam catapults. The Lexington was old and she had electric catapults. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had backed up their, catap their electricity with batteries. Mm -hmm. And somebody figure that the batteries had exploded. When they were in full charge, all of a sudden there was this terrific explosion. And they immediately called out the repair party started running there to help. And um, so that, that course gave the repair parties were all in place so they could fight this fire because there was some fire. The only thing is, they get the fire out in one compartment they start in the next compartment, and the compartment on each side of them explode. 
Put a put more repair party on there. One of them there. One of them there. And that, um, beyond that would explode. They wouldn't want to warn in the world. Of course, if that battery could have got exploding power and could have exploded, but no one thought that, was, that, was, that there was something else that's going on. We were fighting fires all over the ship at that time. But they didn't account for as much as the one time when the fourth gender kicked the worst thing into it. And that was the death knell of the Lexington, because it began to explode down below decks in the aviation furies. And that was the end. It just started to blow. And it worked its way all the way through the ship. And the second explosion blew the forward elevator completely out of its socket and it settled down about six inches below the flight deck. So there was no way that a fl an airplane could fly off the deck anymore. So the carrier then was fired uh, below the bridge and forward of the bridge. It's right below where the catapults were. And they're having an awful time putting it out because they would only get a cart way out. Evidently, the, the paint that was burning in these state rooms was getting so hot that every, anything, everything would melt them and they're having an awful time getting the fire to go out and stay out. But sometimes they get it completely out and all of a sudden they go, whoosh, light up again. And one compartment set the next compartment next to it on fire. Crawling above it, crawling below it, on each side of it, all suddenly go on fire too at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that's having an awful one. So now the ship is uh, burning and they're fighting the fire mm -hmm. and the fire is getting away from them. And they come back clear to the forward elevator. And all of a sudden there was a terrific explosion under the elevator, blew it in the air, tipped on the side, and fell back in the hole, laid on the side. Finally, the captain says, the people in the engine room were passing out. They were passing out right and left. It was 150 degrees where they were. No human could stand that for very long. So, so he finally said, all right, all engineering forces secure everything and go topside. That's what we did. We just shut off the boilers because the ship had 16 boilers. We was down, I was, we was down the fire, and my, me and my crew were. And as we were going, and pretty soon it got quiet. It seemed like the ship would stop. It just was quiet. We lost all communication down there. Blowers went off. And the uh, only thing we had, it might have been a little auxiliary light. And we didn't know what was going on. You couldn't hear nothing, no communication. It seemed like the ship was just sitting there. And we lost the area. The area against comes from the top side of the blowers. We weren't getting any air. We stayed there a while, and I said, I said, we better get out of there. We don't know what's going on, whether the ship slinks or not. We couldn't tell if it was going. And so uh, <clears throat> I went up there, and I was about the biggest man I'd Get a couple of dogs loose, you know, and they come back down and they go back in and get a couple more loose and come back down and and I was defeated. I, I couldn't, I had no air, no light, and about four of us. And uh, I just defeated. I couldn't, it's hard, I couldn't raise my arm. So I just, I was down there and I said, well, this is the end of the road, boy. And when you know that, when you know you're gone, or you, you feel like a whole screen flashes in front of you, which past life and everything. And that, <clears throat> and that suspense and stress, I guess everybody got a breaking point. And this one old boy, he just cracked up, tried to climb the bulkheads, the steel walls. We could try to calm him down to go away, you the devil. Right now, I'm in the engineering course, and I went topside like I was told to do. 
I got up on the flight deck and looked down, and there's a whole airplane, the whole landing, and all fueled, and all some of them had bombs and had torpedoes, and all ready to go. And he's sitting there on the deck. And there's an awful, awful lot of black smoke. You couldn't see much of anything. You know, inside the ship and put this room and leave the smoke right in. And somebody came up from over the side, because on the port side, three quarters of the way back on the ship, along the catwalk, you know, they had, uh, they had floats and they had ice cream of all kind. And somebody went in there and started helping them something. And then nobody said anything, so everyone just started doing the same thing. Everyone or in the end, but all took their turn of going down, helping themselves to ice cream. So we sat on the deck eating ice cream. You know, and was just, oh, my ship's burning. And that was when there was a lot of us had to abandon because of injuries. I went down with the wounded onto a destroyer that had pulled alongside, and the fires and explosions kept going better and worse and all. And finally, Captain Sherman and Admiral Fitch got together and said, you'd better get these fellows off of here, or we're going to go down with them. So they sounded the abandoned ship about a quarter to five in the evening, and the ship was completely a fireball. And so everybody got off. We, If we ever see any of the pictures in magazines or newspapers or whatever it is, Life did a good job on it of seeing all of the sailors going down the lines at the fantail, heading for the water to get out of the way of the, of the fury. They could not get off because they're, they're the only place they could go, but there was no place on the flight deck. At 5.30 or quarter to six, all hands were clear, and our ships finally went back After the uh, carrier was on fire and sinking, all the ships stopped and they circled around us. They weren't worried about submarines. And uh, there was 1,500 on the carrier. 300 were killed, and I don't know how many wounded, a lot of them. But during the rescue, they, they didn't lose a crew member. The destroyers back up where their fan tail, the back of the ship, was under the flight deck, and they lowered the wounded down onto the decks of these these destroyers. A lot of men slid down ropes, and their hands were burned terribly. I jumped feet first, and I thought I was never going to come back up again. But then I uh, there was a raft in the water, and they, they had a wounded man on there, and he didn't have any clothes on him. Every inch of his body was water blisters. He's been born in an explosion, and when the seawater hit his flesh, he just screamed. I never did find whether he, I doubt if he lived after they got him in. I swam around to finally the, the cruiser, uh, uh, Minneapolis picked me up and they put a cargo net over the side. I tried to climb up with my wet clothes, my shoes on, up this net. I got about halfway up and I ran out of gas and some sailor he scrambled down and pulled me like a wet fish up on the deck. <laughs> and we thought, well, when, the, when it gets to the magazines, well, maybe that'll, that'll spur a little action. Finally, the call came uh, after they had taken all the wounded off. When the uh, abandoned ship came, uh, people went went uh, for the water any way they could get there, and uh, I uh, went to my plane and and uh, took out a raft, uh, blew it out, blew it up, and uh, and uh, lowered it, and uh, looked down, and, and uh, it was it was all full as. Uh, as soon as it hit the water, any 
part in the storm. Uh, I went to another plane, got a raft, and uh, told a, a friend that I'm going to lower this down. I want you to go with it and hold a place for me, please. Uh, which, uh, which he did, but uh, the place was about one, uh, one hand width uh, around the line surrounding the raft. She had 16 bars, but she shut off. They shut off everything, including, including the saltwater pumps. Now, the saltwater pumps gave the fire means salt water to fight the fire. Now they suddenly have nothing to fight the fire with. So throughout the ship, they had the handy going because, which was gasoline power. <clears throat> They'd set them on the hangar deck, hang the hose over the side into the water near the ocean, and they suck the water out of the ocean and pump it into the type of fire. Where, where my bunk compartment was, like I said, was just outboard of where they stored the torpedoes on the hangar deck. So they, sent, uh, they sent a seaman down to find out how the warheads on those torpedoes are doing. Because none of those things were off to blow the whole side of the ship apart. He put his hand on two of the torpedoes, and they were just plain hard. The next two he put his hand on, he went away with no skin on his head. Neither one. He blitzed it, it hot. It was about ready to explode, I was thinking. And there was a whole bunch of them, I'm not sure how many. But I remember seeing maybe 40, 50 different torpedoes hanging in a row. Any one of those would blow the whole side of the ship apart. Then we got about 40 of them. They're all, all knitting hard. So the well, captain says we're going to have to bang the ship. So that's what we do. And then uh, after a little bit, well, uh, it was about all about to get beyond ourselves, I guess. We heard some tapping up there and I heard them dogs, uh, knocking them dogs a little open the door and it was like angels from heaven. Yeah, because it had been a while ago. They check all the fire rooms in the place. They will take all the water top compartments. But we knew that was all of it. Because <laughs> we knew we was gone. There was no way out because uh, we didn't know the ship was sinking. We couldn't do nothing. And it was getting hot. Because your air comes from the blower's top side. That's your air condition. <laughs> so uh, it was probably about Five o'clock in the afternoon, and they found said abandoned ship. There was nothing we can do. Abandoned ship. So the firefighters stopped fighting the fire, and all everybody started abandoning the ship. Now my abandoned yeah. ship station was at the after end of the, the smokestack. So I went to my abandoned ship station, found a rope hanging over the side with a knot tied about every two feet. I started down that rope. Well, I kept going. And, uh, the water should be here pretty soon. The next thing I know, there was a, a steel deck on my feet. There's no ocean. There's a steel deck. I'm sitting on the. There's no steel deck sticking out from the side of the ship. It, what's going on here? But I couldn't see anything. There's too much smoke. It's black. So, little by little, I allowed my weight to be set on my feet. Took the line still in my hand and. And finally came to the barbette of a turret, so I'm on his ship, alongside the Lexington. He, so I was turned around, put my back against the turret, and waited. Well, now, all these people are abandoning ship, they're coming down, well, a huge number of them are coming down behind it, and in the water, the water is full of people. How in the world is the ship going to get away from the carrier? All those people, because they try to back down, they're going to back right over the top of them. You know, you kill every one of them. Now, what are they going to do? Every time we returned, everyone was interested in watching the election because she was smoking and burning. She was listing quite a bit more in jail than we were on. She was listing on burning and smoke of war and others. And it's starting to get dusk. It's about six o'clock, and it's just starting to get dusk. And you know, everyone began to run. What are you going to do about this? So the Japanese are here somewhere, not very really far from here. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that hit us today. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to advertise that we're, here's another carrier that we <clears throat> worked on and cruisers and all these destroyers. We're advertising where we're at. And you got those carriers that are going to come and sink a whole bunch of us. We're going to do something about that collection. Then, so well, we found out very shortly what they had to do.
and told one of the destroyers to go around the Lexington and hit, fire a whole six torpedoes after the ship and sink them. Fire them all six torpedoes. Of course, only two of them. During all during that time of the war, American torpedoes, one out of six exploded. It didn't do anything. The commander of the Lexington and one of the survivors, they saved even the dog. Our country can well be proud of the performance of the officers and men of the Lexington. Their conduct was magnificent. It makes you proud to be an American, to see the way these boys perform. This is an air war, and there's nothing that will stop a determined air attack. It's interesting to note the conduct of these men when we had to abandon ship. They took off their shoes, rolled their socks, placed them neatly on the flight deck as if they were coming back to them again. They are typical American boys. Some of them went down to the ice cream fountain just at the end and filled their tin hats with ice cream and calmly ate ice cream on the flight deck just before taking to the water. The traditions of the Lexington will live on. She was a grand ship. Those of our men who failed to return, the world will not forget. They were heroes of the first battle between carriers in the history of the world. So, years later, they went to analyze what happened from the survivors, what, what they heard, what they saw, analyzed, and they discovered that what had happened was the torpedoes hit up forward, it was up on the forward uh, port bow. The, the was after one was just almost broadside to the bridge. That's where the fuel tanks were. Gasoline fuel tanks for the airplanes. And they destroyed two of the tanks and ruptured two or three other tanks with aviation gasoline. The aviation gasoline has fumes. The fume drifted up from there went throughout the whole forward half of the ship, lifting one compartment to the next compartment, one by one, until it started exploding. When it started exploding then, that made it even worse. The fumes are even worse than ever before. And now it was just gasoline explosions for the world. One of the generators, evidently, uh, gasoline fumes are you know, amongst those generators yeah. that made sparks, and that was it. Okay, now, that area of the ship was the admiral's quarter, the captain's quarter, the officer's quarters, and it was the ship's. Uh, well, they keep the records of the ship for the crew. Uh, that uh, end pay department, that was all that area that was what the ship was. And all through that area, there wasn't anybody doing anything there. So no one was there to smell anything. They just filled up and before anyone knew it, it started exploding. 